Um, so it, it's a great pleasure to be able to welcome Dr. Aaron Jacob from the Yellowstone to Yukon Initiative to our IBIS seminar series. Um, I'm such a big fan of Aaron's that it's going to be really hard for me to uh, give a, a quick and professional introduction, but, but I'll totally do my best. Um, I, I think it's important to point out that Aaron is um, a recipient of the Early Career Conservationist Award from the Global Society for Conservation Biology. Um, they, they read that this was recognition for extraordinary leadership, vision, and achievements in environmental science. So she, she's really a, a, a global star. Um, one of the things that makes me such a fan of Erin's work is the emphasis that she, as a natural scientist, puts on science communication and engagement. I, I think that really helps maximize sort of the impact and policy relevance of her work, which crosses many different orders. You know, Yellowstone to Yukon initiative. Uh, if it's in the US, it's also in Canada crosses many different lands and land use types and, and local jurisdictions and indigenous lands. And you know, I, I think that, you know, Erin really stands out as a role model in the way she navigates this type of complex terrain and, and shows all of us natural scientists how we can more meaningfully engage with different communities. Um, I use it as an example in my classes when I teach about how biologists like me, conservationists, um, can really make better contributions to, to sustaining coupled human natural systems and environmental justice. So um, thanks, Aaron, for, for coming today and, and chatting with our community and, and giving us this presentation. Um, I'll turn it over to you. This is uh, from Yellowstone to Yukon, Science and Action to Connect and Protect Habitat. Well, thanks for that uh, lovely introduction. I'm, I'm blushing. And thank you very much for the invitation to come and talk about the work that we at Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative and our many partners do across this, this extraordinary part of uh, Western North America. Um, so it's a, I love, I love, I miss seeing people in person, but one of the great things about doing this online is that, um, you know, we can talk so to many more people. Speech. We can talk to many more people. And so I'll, uh, I'll get going here. So we're going to talk about how Yellowstone to Yukon and our partners, how do we connect and protect habitat? And I, when I thought about putting this talk together, I, if we work on so many different things across a huge and very busy landscape that it's often hard to decide what are we going to talk about? And so some of the reasons that I chose the things I did is because they're the kind of things that I wanted to know when I was in grad school, when I was a postdoc. Uh, and science plays an extraordinarily important role in conservation, but science is by no means the most important thing. And science, once it, when it's done, does not equate to change. So I'm part of the reason I'm talking about the things that I am is I wanna give people a sense of what does it take to actually make a difference? What role does science and do scientists individually and collectively play in making that kind of change? So as we go along, um, please feel free to put questions in the chat. Uh, I won't be able to, to answer as we go through, but afterwards I'm, I'm happy to. And if there are things we don't get to today or something that's you know bugging you over the weekend or in the months to come, please feel free to send me an email. I'm always happy to chat about, about ideas. I do want to mark um, a really important individual who passed away last week, and that's Dr. David Schindler. Oh, who, shit. Oh, no. Oh, I'm sorry if people didn't know that. Um, yeah, Dr. Schindler was oh. an enormous... An enormous influence uh, uh, for for the world, for um, one of I think he's one of the greatest ecologists of our time, and uh, he was an extraordinary scientist, absolutely outstanding research for more than fifty years, particularly in freshwater ecology in Canada. But what was equally important is his tireless communication about why that science matters, what is at stake for the things that he was studying, he and his, his many colleagues studying. And he spoke truth to power about acid rain, phosphates, climate change, the oil sands, mega dams, indigenous rights, and more. And there is there have been many tributes in the Canadian um, media in the last week about his work, but I think that the best is this terrific article about um, his life, his work, many fun stories too. This is celebrating a life. Um, so please check it out. It's in a, an outlet called the Taiyi. And please let yourself be inspired for what your research, your partnership, and your communication can achieve. And I think it's important, in addition to knowing about the people who are involved, it's important to know about the places where we work, where we live, where we play. 
I use nativeland.ca, uh, which is a website to help me learn a little bit about the indigenous peoples who have stewarded these lands for thousands of years. And for instance, I'm talking to you from my home in Canmore, Alberta, just outside Banff National Park. And this is Treaty 7 territory, was signed in 1877 between Crown, um, Queen Victoria on behalf of Canada uh, and the indigenous um, people in this area. It's the territory of the Blackfoot, the Tanaha, the Stony Nakoda, and the Satina nations. And we can Google how to pronounce those words correctly. But knowing that, that is one small step in a much longer path towards reconciliation among Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. One small step that we can all take, but we have to go a lot farther. So this is a really great paper that came out in October last year um, by Carmen Wong, uh, researchers in mostly in the Yukon or entirely in the Yukon and, in, and Indigenous um, experts, Indigenous elders. And it provides concrete, actionable steps that scientists can take both institutionally and individually. And although the title says natural scientists, I would argue that this is, is applicable for all disciplines. This would be a great journal club or a lab group discussion or a series of discussions. And later towards the end of my talk, I'll provide some more resources for people to think about. If you're a bit like me, the last year might've felt a little bit like this. There's a lot of heavy stuff going on in the world. So, in addition to the pandemic, we are facing a million species at risk of extinction. We're on track for three degrees warming by the end of the century, and there is rising inequality around the world. So that, that's a lot, that's a lot of stuff. And the last year has been hard for many people um, and it hasn't affected us all equally. Despite that, I wanna focus on where I find hope and courage given these things. I wanna take you to some of the places in Western North America where despite existing and significant, in many cases, significant social, economic, and environmental problems, people care an awful lot. And where science and hard work and collaboration, they are making things better for people and for nature. So first I wanna emphasize why, why this part of Western North America? Why is this so unusual? Why is it important for us to think about conservation here and beyond these borders? So this is a paper from 2004 that evaluated the, the ranges of large and medium-sized mammals, 14 of them. And this is everything from a fox to, to a moose and to a bison. When the researchers looked at this in, in what we can think of as historic times, so maybe about 400 years ago, in dark red, you can see the overlapping ranges of these large and medium-sized mammals. But when they, they evaluated at this point, 2004, those ranges, you can see how much has shrunk. You can see that places with higher human influence were more likely to have those range contractions and species were less likely to persist. And so the place that's outlined in black, that's where I work. That's the Yellowstone to Yukon region. And in North America, this is the stronghold for large mammals. This is one of the reasons that this place is so important that we need to keep these species here and deal with the many problems in this area as well as elsewhere. So I wanna show a little bit, to bring that home to an individual level. I'm gonna show you a series of animations of the individual animals. So the first one is of a wolf called Pluie. Pluie is a famous wolf. It's not many uh, wolves that you know, get called out by name on shows like The West Wing. And in 1991, Pluie was collared not far from where I live in uh, outside Banff National Park. And over the next two years, she went on a very, very long walk. And so her travels across more than 100,000 square kilometers across many, many different political jurisdictions. I think it's 30 in total. That's one of the things that that showed us was that effective conservation has to go beyond national borders, has to go beyond provincial state borders. But Pluie isn't the only animal that has shown us that. This uh, series is gonna be of a, a female grizzly bear called Ethel. Ethel also went for a very long walk not too long ago, starting outside of her main digs in, uh, in Idaho. She went past Florence and Missoula in Montana, eventually to Eureka near Glacier National Park. And for a species like a grizzly bear that can end up in a lot of interactions with people or towns along the way, like that picture, that's a really big deal. So Ethel is crossing interstate highways, major city boundaries, municipal landfills, residential backyards. And 
part of the reason we work at the scale that we do at Yellowstone to Yukon is because animals need to move, but also because people have to be able to live with that. So we need to think about not only the boundaries that she's crossing, animals like her, but also what are the potential problems that they're coming along, they're coming into along the way. And it's not just big carnivores. This is a picture of um, deer 255, the most famous mule deer in the world. And she sure knows what it means to move. So not once, but twice, did she travel across a massive expanse of land from Southern Wyoming to Idaho. And that's 250 miles, more than 400 kilometers. She did it again in 2018 while pregnant with twins. So that long distance trek was so impressive that researchers first questioned if it was a fluke the first time around. And she's the record holder for the longest migration by a mule deer. And those are just examples of individuals. So we have to think about how do individuals scale up to groups, to populations and to communities. And one of the big things I wanna to impart to people is this idea about animals needing to move and needing to cross boundaries this, one of, this is one of the images that really hits it home for me. This shows different elk herds out in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So each of the squiggly colors on here, that's a different elk herd. And this is made by uh, folks at the Wyoming Migration Initiative. And on the map, you can see a variety of different, um, different jurisdictions for land. There's federal land, which is in green or in yellow, the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. There's state land, which is in purple. And there's also a lot of private land in this area. So elk that need to move outside of the national park where there's cool temperatures and summer rains that make the grass really green for a long time. But in the winter, they're going back to the foothills in the valley bottoms to avoid cold weather and deep snow. And they have to be able to move freely across those large landscapes in order to grow fatter, to produce more offspring than their sedentary counterparts. Because not all animals do this. And through through the work that YDY and others have done, we see over and over and over again, the importance of collaboration across these kind of boundaries. And thinking about what it means when animals who don't know that there's a boundary move across that boundary. And yet, it may surprise you to learn that no land management agencies in Canada or the US have been tasked with implementing corridors. And they don't have the policy, the tools to do that, whether it's legislation, policy, or regulation. So science can help us to identify corridors, and we can put up signs like this, and we can draw lines on a map, but it doesn't necessarily change what happens on the ground. Where is the cross-cutting policy? Where is it grounded in evidence that helps to break down those silos across different jurisdictions? Where are the innovative ways to actually approach development and management? And if we don't have that kind of overarching guidance, how can these ecological networks of parks, protected areas, and the connectivity areas between them, the corridors, how can we expect that to remain stable, especially with changes in governments and economies or other factors? So last year was a big year for this idea about international policy guidance. For the first time, we finally have global guidelines for corridors. And the lead author on this, Dr. Jody Hilty, is the president and chief scientist of Y2Y. She literally wrote the book called Corridor Ecology. So the, this, um, these global guidelines are specifically meant for communities, managers, policymakers, and practitioners all around the world. And it's based on decades of accumulative evidence and practice. So it's been 20, nearly 20 years in the making, and it's involved more than 100 experts in 30 countries. So if you're interested in these things and particularly in how the science actually can be distilled to recommendations about policy, regulation, legislation, I'd really encourage you to check that out. Next, of course, COD means implementing it through national, subnational, regional, local governments and civil society. So some of the examples I'm gonna talk about in the second half of my talk today are about how that is breaking um, down on the ground, especially in, uh, in the Western US. And like you, I like reading the scientific literature. Um, I don't get to read as much of it as, as I would like to. But when I read this paper a few days ago, I stopped cold. So researchers looked at information about animal movements for more than 167 species around the world, mostly from North America and Europe. Let us think about that in terms of collab international collaboration. And they specifically were wondering how do human activities and habitat modification, how does that affect animal movement? And what they found was that for more than two thirds of those over 700 cases, there was a change in movement of more than 20% or more. 
how does that break down for different species groups? And I actually presented this research to um, to the town of council or town of Canmore's council and mayor earlier this week because in this town where I live, we're talking about corridors and talking about development. And I wanted to show the wealth of information that we know internationally about these things. But I wanted to break it down to decisions that happen on the ground, places like this, that we need to be at, taking action on. So I talked to them about how what we know about amphibians and arthropods and how the movement distances of those animals are changing. And then for, um, for birds, for fish, and particularly for mammals and reptiles, one of the things that we see is that these, many of these animals are having to move much farther um, distances. In fact, on average, the increase in movement was more than 70%. So imagine if you had to move more than 70% just to make up your, your day and their home ranges are shrinking. So we know that animals need to move already. We know that human activities and habitat modification are having these big widespread impacts. So what are some of the solutions? What are some of the other things that are going on that we need to think about here? A big one is about protected areas. Protected areas, of course, are the cornerstone for biodiversity conservation, but they alone are not enough. One of the reasons they're not enough, I would argue, is that there's simply not enough protected areas, but also they are not well connected. So only 10% of the world's parks are connected, which particularly in countries like Canada, where I live, is shocking. This should be shocking to us. And that breaks down, of course, on a country by country level. This uh, figure shows on the x-axis, the um, proportion of a country or territory protected. So a lot of those purple areas, you know, they're not well, uh, they might not be well protected, they might not be well connected. Where I live, Canada, second biggest country in the world, known internationally for what we describe as having rich, quote unquote, pristine forests, water. We only have 11% of this country protected and only a quarter of that can be considered well connected. And where you are in the US, this is 12% protection and much less of that is well connected, much higher degree of habitat fragmentation, larger population sizes. And really most of that 15% that's connected, that's in Alaska. So there are big issues that we need to be thinking about in terms of protection and in connectivity. And I'm gonna talk about both of them as we go forward. A little bit about the Yellowstone to Yukon region. It is big, 1.3 million square kilometers. That's twice the size of Texas. And this, this spans two countries, five states, two territories, two provinces, and the traditional lands of more than 75 indigenous groups. It's a big, big area. And we break it down at YDY into 11 different priority areas. I won't go into the details about different ones, but I think this is important for people to know because it's not just a monolith all the way through. It's not like the YDY region from Southern Wyoming is the same all the way up to the Northern Yukon. And it's important to identify what are the different threats um, and opportunities in each of those, those priority areas. Another aspect about YDY is the vision. When people talk about Yellowstone to Yukon, the region, they also talk about the YDY vision which is a hundred year vision for this region. And it's that if our work is successful, there will be an interconnected system of wild lands and waters stretching from Yellowstone to Yukon, harmonizing the needs of people with those of nature. And for me, this aspect of both people and nature is crucially important for Wide Wise work. It is not about making this entire area a park and kicking people out. It is not about saying no to development. It is about understanding that nature has limits and we generally have not been living within those limits and there are big consequences on that. So that brings me to Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative, which is a uh, joint Canada-US nonprofit organization. And I know that I am only one person from a 30 person organization standing in front of you. So please know that there are many, many people working here who do many different jobs all together. Uh, I love working in the nonprofit sector. It's a, there's a lot of opportunity here. It's a, it's a great place to be. I'm happy to take questions with that at the end. So across the YDY region, we work to protect core habitats. We work to keep those areas connected or to restore lost connections. And we work to inspire others to do this similar large landscape work where we think across all kinds of borders. When YDY was formed in about 1993, 
only 9% of this area could be considered strictly protected. And that's in things like parks and wilderness areas. And 4% of it could be considered conserved through other means, through things like recreation zones and private conservancies. They're not in the IUCN um, protected areas categories, but they are contributing to conservation in some way. When we last did this analysis in 2014, we need to redo it again. You can see that there's that has risen hugely. So up to 14% strictly protected lands. And you can see where those are filling in, especially in, the, in Northern Canada. But the biggest change here is that whopping 23% of other conservation measures. So this is helping to knit together that landscape. So it's not just about parks. It's also about how, to, how does this work as a functional ecological network. We have a long way to go and it's not easy. And because we work across an enormous area on many different things, and this is a busy, busy landscape, you have to work with people. So we are an intensely collaborative organization. Since 1993, we've worked with more than 450 partner groups, and that's businesses, all levels of government, many other nonprofits, private landowners, scientists of all stripes, and more. And we have to do that. Collaboration is an integral part of effective, durable conservation. It is not always easy. We often work with groups who don't work with each other. And so when you're this big tent organization, you have to be really careful about the kind of things that you choose to engage on and how it's really aligned to your mission. You wanna be cautious not to have what's called mission drift, which is where you start working on everything across the region. So that is hard. And collaboration takes a lot of work, takes active, it's like democracy, it's, a, it's an active verb. But we, in the reason that YDY and our partners have been successful is because people see themselves in different aspects of that vision. So you have this big vision, you have this idea, these ideals of what you want that landscape to be like, but specifically, what do you work on and how? Our conservation targets include things like wide valleys, really important floodplains, gravel bed rivers, <coughs> excuse me, old growth forest, particularly in parts of British Columbia, as well as big, wide ranging animals. Things like grizzly bears, wolverine, mountain caribou. They might be long lived, slow to reproduce, and they need to move. They have to have both their core habitat protected and it has to be well connected. So that helps to guide some of the things we work on and some of the things we don't work on are these kind of conservation targets. And then what do you do? You care about these animals, you care about these places, but how do you actually achieve your vision? We, there are eight themes that guide our work and I'll talk about them in a little bit. So across that huge and very busy wide wide landscape, we highlight and focus on local issues that have implications for the region as a whole. And we work to stitch together that landscape in eight themes. And that includes restoring, maintaining wildlife linkages on private lands, protecting core habitat and strengthening the management of public lands. We work to advance policies and practices that support the YDY vision. We work a lot on human wildlife coexistence because it's not enough to have animals ranging across this landscape if they're gonna get into trouble with people. We work on to make state roads safer for people and for wildlife. That photo um, was actually taken really close to where I live uh, in Canmore when seven elk were killed uh, by one, one truck passing. That's a big deal for people who drive small cars like me. We work to assess a pr uh, proposed development and we speak out against it if it brings more harm than benefit. We work to restore damaged wildlife habitat, particularly in key linkage zones. And we promote our vision for connected terrestrial and aquatic landscapes with people all over the world. It's one of the most fun parts of my job. So I'm only gonna talk about a few of these today because we, we don't have that much time. First, I wanna talk about big picture conservation thinking, particularly big protected areas. Canada, like 195 other countries around the world, uh, not including the US yet, um, uh, is a signatory to the Convention on Biological Diversity. And that means that we were also, we've agreed to protect at least 17% of our land and fresh water by December 31st, 2020. We were supposed to get to 17%. We were at about 10% when this was signed. And I'll let you know that three months ago, we only made it to 12% protected. But 
there was a 10 year process whereby governments in Canada, all levels, were thinking about how they're supposed to protect these places and where are they supposed to protect it. If we're trying to halt global uh, biodiversity loss and reverse it, we have to be really careful about where we choose to protect. Canada could have protected all of Baffin Island and achieved that 17% goal, but it wouldn't have halted biodiversity loss. As well, one of the other things to consider um, that we were required to consider as a country is where do people get benefits from nature? Where are the ecosystem services? And how do you ensure that new protected areas will be well connected, well managed, equitable, all kinds of other things? So I was part of a, a government science advisory panel um, that provided options to the government about how to do this, particularly for biodiversity and for ecosystem services. So when my colleagues and I were starting to do that work, we looked around for, surely Canada has these maps. Surely Canada, second biggest country in the world, known internationally for its forest, for its water. Surely we've mapped out where the carbon is. Surely we've mapped where the most important places that produce water for people, for big cities, for industrial purposes. And in fact, we found that Canada hadn't. So part of the reason that it's great to work with, uh, work with nice folks that you know from grad school is that you can continue to work together for years. So a research paper that was published just a, a, a couple of months ago uh, it is where we identified how, how, what are some of the key benefits that people get from nature in Canada, and particularly a new advancement in how to connect that nature's supply of benefits, where does nature create things like fresh water, with the human demand, where are all those people who need to drink it. And this is a new, uh, new advancement for ecosystem services kind of work, but it was acutely applied to this conservation context because Canada is considering how to, and now we've agreed 25% uh, by 2025 and 30% by 2030, Canada is gonna be making some huge decisions about new big protected areas. And they are considering in addition to biodiversity, which as a conservation biologist is extraordinarily important to me, they're also gonna be making these decisions on information like ecosystem services. And they didn't have this kind of information before, which is really pretty surprising. So we mapped carbon storage, fresh water, and nature-based recreation across the country. And importantly, we were able to look at not only where nature supplies those benefits, but also where people need them. And where do those two things fit together? If you have supply and you have demand, you have the provision of a benefit to people. You have actually the delivery of an ecosystem service. So I'm gonna show you a series of maps. Uh, this was a, I'm not a modeler. This was a modeling intensive paper. So I'm grateful to my collaborators for that. Um, and I'm going to show you just the results of the provision of the service. So where is this combination of supply and demand and how did it actually get to people? First, we'll look at fresh water. So here, the places that are in red are, um, are higher importance for that fresh water provision. And one of the reasons is because people who are downstream from those areas, big cities in Canada like Toronto, Montreal, Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, these are places where there are many, many people who need water for all kinds of things, for drinking, for industrial purposes, um, for hydroelectricity, for irrigating crops, but it's originating from these places um, that are often upstream. So you have to connect those two things together. And it showed that places like the rock, Eastern slopes of the Rockies in Alberta were crucially important for providing that service of fresh water. Similarly with recreation, we looked at where does nature supply these marvelous things that are often typically used in marketing about recreation, things you might see in an REI catalog, which is not complete aspect of recreation, but is, is one part of it and the one that we could model. We looked at where does nature provide those kind of things, but also where are these big cities? We've seen in the last year how important it is for us to have nature nearby the places we live. And we saw again that parts of British Columbia, the Rocky Mountains, and particularly Southern Alberta and Southern Quebec emerged as really important for providing that benefit to millions and millions of people. Carbon was a little bit simpler because where nature supplies the carbon is exactly where that benefit gets to accrue to people around the world. And so we looked at below ground carbon and above ground carbon. And for someone who spent a large part of her life studying forests, it was really interesting to me to see just that density of carbon in the north, particularly the area around Hudson's Bay, those lowlands, that peat lowlands are so concentrated, so dense in carbon that it really swamps a lot of the above ground carbon held in trees. Doesn't mean that the treat areas aren't important, but it gives us a perspective on, on the total carbon importance of these places. 
So we added them up all together. And in a land use planning process, you would not keep them equal. But we did because we're uh, not involved in the decisions about what's more important than another. And we looked at where are the total combined benefits for these things. And you can really see that those aspects of, uh, of water and of recreation um, and also the carbon comes through too. You can see these combined provision areas. So I work in Eastern British Columbia in the Western part of Alberta in the Rocky Mountains. And this kind of information is helping us and our partners to plan big protected areas because the government is required to make decisions include using a, mul a multitude of, uh, of factors, including stuff like this. But doing the research is just one thing. How do you ensure that it's actually used? How do you ensure that it's useful to people? And a big part of that is that you have to plan. You have to plan in advance. We know what these results are. You know, we know when you, when you, before you even finish writing and submitting the paper. So we planned for things like an interactive data visualization tool so that people can explore the data themselves. So that people can look at things like where are the existing protected areas, which are shown in green here. And where is the, are the things like natural resource extraction, coal mining, um, logging, other types of mining. Uh, that are happening in these places. And actually it overlaps a lot. So there's a lot of really difficult discussions in things like impact assessment that I've also worked on a lot where we have to make decisions about should we really be logging in some of the, the forest that is, uh, has the most dense carbon? Um, should we really be coal mining in places like Alberta's Eastern slopes that provide water all across the prairies? So it's just additional information to help people use that. And one way that you can uh, have a lot of um, attract a lot of attention about this is if you can make it a media moment. And we were really fortunate in that we did. There are more than 100 stories in January uh, about this research. And it's because we planned. And I'm really fortunate to work with some extraordinary communicators uh, and people who, you know, who are great journalist networks where we could identify across the country. How is this this issue important to people who live in Quebec? How is this important to people who are planning indigenous protected areas in all parts of Canada? What does it mean for coal mining? And so we got a lot of media attention. Media attention is not the same as conservation change, but it opens a lot of doors. And so one of the things we've been doing in the last two months, um, including actually uh, just yesterday, is talking to people all across the country in all levels of government about this kind of work. And we're trying to do it in a learning way for us as well. We know that this is the first, you know, first pass of this kind of research. We're not going to get it right, all of it. It's, we're going to miss some things. So in addition to helping people understand, these are the data, these are the results. By the way, it's all open access. You can download the data and use it yourself. We wanted to ask them, is this useful to you? Did we, did we miss here? Why or why not is it useful? What additional stuff would be useful for you? There's reasons that we didn't map pollination, flood protection, all other ecosystem services. If we had, would that have been the clincher? Because we'll have to spend a lot of time doing some of those. Some of them might be easier. And more in a, in a kind of bigger picture way, how can this kind of research support the decisions that you are making? Things about land and water conservation, but also about natural resource management and planning. One of the coolest aspects that we've seen in this, um, this work, and it feels really good to do stuff like this that people want to use, is about carbon. So this, here I'm showing you the top 20th um, percent, top 20 percent of total stored carbon in Canada in red. And in fact, a lot of those places where we've mapped where the, the, all this carbon is, those places overlap with areas that have already been identified particularly by indigenous communities, as important for conservation, as important for, uh, for their identity. So I'm just gonna show a few examples. For instance, the Gwich'in land use plan in uh, Northern Northwest Territories and parts of the Yukon, some extremely high density uh, below ground carbon. Same with the Satu land use plan and the Decho land use plan. And we're talking about big protected areas, hunt like thousands and thousands of square kilometers. The same with the Seal River watershed in Northern Manitoba and Kamachuanaki, which is actually the world's first UNESCO World Heritage Site for both cultural and, um, and natural reasons. So this, the kind of information that I'm presenting here is one thing that people might consider in land use planning, but it is important. And it is something that especially folks who are living in, in the North, away from some of these big centers, they're using as a case to make, uh, to make that case for why their place is important for the broader picture to say we're, our work, our stewardship over years has kept the carbon in the ground. And we want to do that. It's part of our vision going forward. 
so that other decision makers can understand it. And as people are discussing the next generation of biodiversity targets through um, uh, including things like 30% by 2030, we're seeing that this emphasis on ecosystem services is staying there. Biodiversity is, I don't want you to get the, get the impression that I don't think biodiversity should be first and foremost. I think it's crucially important, but so too is this aspect of ecosystem services. And that was a big gap in how people were measuring and modeling it, um, certainly across Canada. So I'm gonna tie up that aspect about big picture protected areas to say there's a lot of work still to come on this and a lot of downscaling national, uh, national information like this to something that's regional uh, and can be used for people in their decisions, especially when they're deciding, you know what, we value carbon a lot less than we value water. So that's just one example from, the, um, from very recent months. I'm gonna spend the rest uh, talking about um, something that's really stemmed from, from this research paper a uh, number of years ago and all the things that have happened since. And it's partly because this is work that has really helped to guide Y2Y -Y and our partners and particularly because it's this part of the transboundary area in Canada and the US. So this is a paper published in the Journal of Wildlife Management. And what this work did was to identify subpopulations of grizzly bears. So that tells us things like genetic isolation. These yellow dotted areas outline those subpopulations. You can see that there's a, a larger area that's sort of in, in gray behind that. That's the current distribution of grizzly bears or it was when this work was, was published a few years ago. You can see that the Yellowstone population that at the time was estimated to be uh, just under 600 animals, that's really separated by other animals that are up in, in the northern part of Montana, up into this contiguous area in, in Canada. So along there, all of those little fracture zones where those little dotted lines are coming together, a lot of them line up with roads. So that's an, that is a big um, part of the kind of conservation that why do I and our partners have done? And maybe one of the things that we're best known for is work for safe wildlife passage across roads. And in particular, I'm going to talk about some areas here. So the uh, black dot at the top there, that's um, the Trans-Canada Highway. So that's really close to where I live. And then two at the bottom are just on the, the US-Canada border. We're going to talk a little bit about private land conservation too. So if you've driven through um, different parts of the world, including uh, Banff National Park, you might have seen things like this. I think that these wildlife crossing structures, they're really easy for people to get. You can see a picture like that and you intuitively understand that it's about trying to help wildlife get from one side of the road to the other. And the reason that they have to go across the crossing structures is because that road is fenced. And the road is fenced because the number of animals that were being hit here, big animals, bears, elk, moose, that, has, that can have population level impacts for a long lived, slow to reproduce species, uh, species at risk like wolverine or like grizzly bears. And frankly, this has a huge human toll, right? If you hit something like a, a moose or an elk, you might, you might not survive that. What people don't see when they drive this landscape is that they're going over many, many, many more underpasses. And next I'm gonna show you why we need both in the landscape. We have to have both these things, some that go under the road, some that go over the road, in order to get close to mitigating the effects of the road. We will never fully mitigate the road. These things do not uh, negate the negative impacts of roads. But for roads that already exist, and certainly ones that are going to be widened, this, goes, uh, this makes a big, a big difference. So when they were first built, people didn't really know if they worked, you know, which is kind of scary if you're putting so much money into this kind of stuff. And in fact, research over years has shown that they do work. More than a dozen mammal species use crossing structures, but they use them differently. Grizzly bears, moose, deer, and elk, they preferred high, wide, short ones. Cougars and black bears prefer long, low, and narrow. But even within a species, there's differences. Female grizzly bears with cubs use overpasses. And a big male grizzly bear, really, they'll go under as well. So we have to think about having both of these things in the landscape in order to meet the needs of a community of species. You might imagine that sometimes I have conversations with, uh, with decision makers where the environmental aspect isn't what's, what's tipping the bill. Uh, they care more about the dollars and cents. And it is expensive to hit wildlife, even if you're just caring about the, the dollar amounts here. So the good news about crossing structures is that they pay for themselves within 10 to 20 years. 
even something as big as those big overpasses that can cost a few million dollars to build, especially if you're already widening that road, you're already having machinery there and people, these things make economic sense in addition to social and environmental sense. And one place in particular where we're starting, uh, where we're, we've been working on this with many partners is this transborder area and it's transborder in three ways, BC to Alberta and to the US. It's called the Elk Valley. And so the Elk Valley area, it's home to these iconic wide ranging animals like grizzly bears, wolverine, elk, bighorn sheep. But it's also one of the last areas where those animals are moving between Canada and the US. So the Elk Valley is a critical part of tying together the Rocky Mountains at a continental scale. And yet there's a huge number of wildlife vehicle collisions in this area for many years. It's expensive, it kills people, and it has population level impacts for some of those species. And we know what the solution is here. Fencing and wildlife crossing structures reduce collisions, they pay for themselves, they reduce mortality, they increase wildlife connectivity. And the, the um, interest in this and how people are really taking this on is, is incredible. It's taken a long time to get this way and, and science certainly played a role in identifying things like, where should you put these crossing structures? This is a 40 kilometer stretch of road uh, between the Crow's Nest communities and Fernie on Highway 3, the Crow's Nest Highway. So why do I and partners have identified a number of places for those underpasses? and also one crucially important place for an overpass project. And this overpass has been called the mother of all wildlife corridors in North America. And that's partly because of that the land on either side of it is protected. So it's been jointly protected by the Nature Conservancy of Canada and by Tech Coal, a coal mining company that operates in the area. We could spend a whole another uh, 45 minutes talking about coal mining and the effects that it has in transboundary areas. But in this, in this case, Tech Coal and others have taken leadership in protecting these, these critical linkage zones. So we're working uh, with the government of British Columbia, other NGOs and scientists to now implement these crossing structures and to monitor them going forward. The good news is that there are more than 1600 kilometers of modified roads in the YDY region. Some of them are just in very initial stages. Some of them have been built and are now moved into the, into the monitoring phase. And a lot of those places are the ones that have been identified as these critical linkage zones between Yellowstone and, uh, and the Canadian Rockies. And this kind of information is great because it can tell, you, can tell you roughly where to work, but it doesn't tell you necessarily where the exact linkage is. One of the reasons that it's so important to use GPS collar data um, is that it can tell you specifically where animals move, not just where the, the genetic fragmentation is. So these squiggly lines are all individually collared grizzly bears moving in southern British Columbia. And all of those animals, they're moving from one side of the valley to the other, protected mountain habitat on either side of that picture, and a very busy valley in the middle with farms, um, small-scale forestry, and a town. And they were all moving past this one place called Duck Lake. And this is a critical linkage area in uh, part of the Yellowstone to Yukon region. And so what Wadawai and partners wanted to do was we wanted to keep it being a critical linkage. We wanted to keep wildlife being able to move across that valley. And so it doesn't mean stopping what's happening there right now. It doesn't mean stopping agriculture or small scale forestry. What it does mean stopping is things like this. Rural sprawl is a huge issue in the West, whether you're in Canada or in the US. So our work here was, um, was to work with the Nature Conservancy of Canada and others uh, to develop a, um, a conservation easement in this area so that wildlife would be able to move across that valley bottom, that linkage would be maintained. And in fact, we, um, this work and others, there are many other critical linkages in this region. So you can see the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, Duck Lake that I just talked about is in pink. The other um, sort of greeny brown areas uh, are in other priorities for private land conservation. And that's because we're trying to knit together this landscape as bears are moving between the Northern Continental Divide, the Cabinet Purcell region to the greater Yellowstone area, and also over to the central Idaho wildlands where they've been absent since, certainly since 1946. So all of that information, science plays a big role in helping us to identify where to work, but it takes a whole lot more than that. 
It takes an enormous amount of fundraising, of working with willing landowners who are concerned about wildlife movement across those places um, to work on important road projects so that we will be able to, uh, to help wildlife move across these busy, busy highways. As I start to wrap up, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about something that's a little bit different for some scientists. And it's a little bit different for a lot of people who aren't scientists. This is the idea about something called ethical space. And in, in many places in the world, including in Canada, and, and I hope in other parts of the US, the social and cultural, the legal and the policy landscape regarding relationships with indigenous and non-indigenous people, it's changing rapidly. And we're all called to explore what this reconciliation means to us individually, for our communities, for our, our economies. But it's difficult too. In Canada, the, the resurgence of indigenous rights, the exercising of treaty rights is causing a lot of communities, a lot of um, uh, different, uh, different industries, causing a lot of strife. And so YWI's role in uh, about ethical space is to create a forum for indigenous and non-indigenous people to get to know each other and to get to learn from each other. And this is particularly for the upper Columbia area of Eastern British BC. So what we did here, and YY plays a different role in, in uh, many of the, the work that we do, um, is to, we, we created a series of workshops where we talked about things like ethical space, which is bringing uh, together uh, this process that acknowledges the different ways that Indigenous and Western cultures view the world. One is predominantly a, a written culture, one is predominantly oral, and in the middle, there's this place of ethical space, this cultural safety for people to really learn about each other, see the connections, and how we can transform the way we work together. Um, I can see that the words are cut off just in the bottom right, but if you want to know more about this, it's the Indigenous Circle of Experts report that breaks down ethical space, specifically in the context of conservation. And so uh, the last year of Zoom being what it is means that what we had initially envisioned as in-person workshops, now we're all online. And actually, it meant that many, many more people could participate. We were blown away by the number of people who've been attending these ethical space workshops. Uh, you can see them all on our website. Uh, the fifth one is coming up um, next week. And they range from everything about what is Indigenous law and how does that actually translate? Um, how does that act, uh, manifest in ways about language, art, songs, ceremonies, and customs? And then Indigenous laws do not depend on the recognition by Canada or other, other uh, governments for their validity or their existence. So this has been a really interesting um, thing to, to I'm not, I'm not uh, a leader in this. I'm not an Indigenous knowledge holder. I'm not a member of an Indigenous nation. But to be part of this, I think, is a really important aspect of conservation being done differently going forward. Um, and particularly in Canada and, and I think in parts of the US YWI region, this is gonna be a really important aspect of effective, durable conservation that is more equitable um, than, than arguably it has been in the past. So I didn't get to talk to you about our work on habitat restoration, on a lot of our endangered species policy work, some really cool stuff happening with caribou uh, in British Columbia, or the fun work we're doing on Wolverine, but there's a blog for that. I'd encourage you to check out the Yellowstone to Yukon blog where we share stories about the work that we and our partners are doing. Uh, and a lot of science is featured in that and a lot of individual scientists. I will say that there is a global shift towards this vision of large landscape conservation and it feels great. So around the world, there are many, many different gra grassroots initiatives, these bottom up conservation movements that are thinking bigger than they have in the past. Why do I is probably the oldest and arguably the most advanced to date, but we're just one of many. And one of the things that I really like about um, this work in Western North America is that we are learning from others around the world and also sharing uh, our successes and our failures. My very last points are that people in, in university, especially people in early career stages, might have heard things like this, that you should just keep your head down, that someone else will speak up, and that the data speak for themselves. I would really encourage you to think about the role of informed, targeted, and strategic communication and advocacy. What can we all do to talk about our work, 
whether or not it's applied, whether or not it's conservation related. Talk about your work and why you are fascinated by it. And then that all helps in this, um, in increasing science literacy and, and numeracy. So specifically, what can conservation, what can scientists do to help conserve nature? Some of the conversations that I had earlier today with, uh, with people at your institution are about communicating early and often, getting training to do that, starting small and scaling up, which means learning from your successes and learning from your failures. Please consider partnering across sectors, and that includes working with people that you might not necessarily think of as your initial collaborators, but who might have information about these things, who will be affected by your work. Please be proactive and scan for emerging issues and, and be ready to respond to those kind of things. I really think we should use multiple metrics of success and we should embrace mistakes, we should embrace diversity and have that um, the, the ethos of inclusion and of equity as some of the foremost things that we do in, uh, as our work in scientists. Please be brave. Please be brave about your science and about its application to the real world because we need you. If you wanna know more about Yellowstone to Yukon, uh, we've got a, a website with a lot of information. You can subscribe to our newsletter, which has all kinds of things from jobs to new science um, to action alerts. We're on all the social media channels, so you can check us out there too. And I would be happy to take questions. That was awesome. I'm sure if we were in an auditorium, you'd be hearing lots of outbursts of applause right now. It's a really inspirational and thought-provoking talk. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, I'm here to moderate a uh, question and answer, so um, feel free to send me a, a note in the chat. Uh, if you have questions, I can read them out loud or I can call on you um, however you like. Um, I'm going to try to sort of start with uh, students and, and early career folks, but really I welcome questions from anyone. Um, Bianca has a question. Bianca, do you want to speak up? Yeah, hi, thanks for a really great talk. Um, I was wondering if you can talk more about like the other conservation methods versus like protected areas in terms of maintaining ecosystem integrity. So in terms of like, I get that other conservation methods might be somewhat easier, but it's not like the gold standard, but is it effective enough for it in comparison to alternative, you know, productive method methods or are we just buying time with these smaller conservation methods? Mm, good question. Um, yeah, and we're buying time on a sinking ship, uh, which is something I think we really should be ambitious in, in what we do. So I would say that uh, although protected areas are, I think we will always need protected areas and we should be thinking, of, we should be thinking about the most important places for, for wildlife and for the benefits that people get from nature and all kinds of benefits, whether that's um, you know, food provision or spirituality, uh, we should think about that. But it's not the only thing. And that the big part of this vision of an ecological network means that they have to be connected. And then that connectivity comes in many different forms. So it can be everything from having uh, impact assessment processes, like environmental impact um, statements that are driven by science um, and that involve, uh, and other forms of evidence, right? Like um, uh, other ways of knowing in Canada recently, a change that we made with legislation is the inclusion of indigenous knowledge as a valid form of evidence in, in impact assessment. Uh, and, and yeah, other types of conservation measures, which can include things like more um, these working landscapes, right? So how do we have wildlife passage across those big, um, big, uh, privately held land um, in different places so that they're not getting into trouble. And what does that mean for the landowners who live there, right? It's not easy to, if you're, if you're a rancher, it is not easy to live with, um, with losses of, of cattle. And uh, especially if you haven't had those big toothy carnivores in that ecosystem for hundred years or more, um, that's brand new, right? Your, your parents and your grandparents didn't necessarily live with that. Uh, so I do think we need both. I am cautious about OECMs, other, other area-based effective conservation measures. It's an extraordinary acronym. Um, and for some things, uh, what counts for an OECM? Just the way that we can make a paper park and you know, it counts on paper and you can measure it and it contributes to your target. It might not be effectively managed. Is it in the right place? Um, and so OECMs like that, you know, if it's a, a fishery closure for one species for one time of the year, Canada is counting that. Right, as part of their contribution to 
So I don't think that's good enough. Uh, uh, however, I have yet to be, be given the divine right to make that decision. So there we are. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, all kinds of, of um, stewardship, you know, things like nature needs half and half earth, these ideas of 50% for protection, it doesn't mean we can do whatever we want on the other 50%. Um, and neither means excluding people, you know, entirely from these places, my goodness. Uh, so yeah, lots to say about that. I do think we should be cautious about things like OECMs, just the same way we should be cautious about, about how we apply protected areas, measure them and, and hold people accountable. Uh, Donnie Chen to say he has a related follow-up. Yeah, thank, thanks again for a, for a great talk. That was, that was fabulous. Um, yeah, uh, related to Bianca's question, um, how does Y2Y um, kind of strategically plan for uh, the effects of climate change in this landscape? Like when, you know, we should maybe be expecting uh, the distribution of high quality wildlife habitat to change dramatically in the future. Yes, um, it is top of mind, and I wish I could tell you the, an easy answer. Um, it it shook a lot of people in certainly in the federal um, in the federal protected areas system to see dip recent research in the last few years looking at that like where you know where would Jasper National Park kind of be in the future? Um, what should we how should how do we have to think about the ecological integrity, which is uh, which is a a federal mandate as part of the Parks Act in Canada. And in the US, how should we think about things like, you know, cheatgrass and other stuff coming into these areas and how will that affect our protected areas? So uh, we know that um, connectivity is a crucial part of, of adapting to climate change and having species, having ecosystems be able to kind of reorganize. And that's called the, you know, we call it the safety net for nature and try to communicate to people that Connectivity was important to begin with, and given climate change, it is even more important, and that that plays out at very local scales, like where I live, we're talking about a corridor across this valley, as well as big, you know, really big scales where we're talking about stop, uh, <laughs> you need to be more careful about the water that you're using from these headwaters, because there's going to be less and less of it in the future. So I, I do see um, some, some extraordinary communication about that using visuals and especially allowing people to fiddle with it themselves. Um, me, does make does seem to make a difference, but it's who's the messenger for some of that stuff. Um, we find, especially people <clears throat> who've lived in landscapes for a long time, a lot of ranchers were super concerned about water, and it's where we find that that um, sweet spot where we're we're interested in in water, yes, and in free flowing rivers and not having them dammed, um, but also in the wild in the passage of wildlife across ranches, and we find that is a really mutually beneficial thing to to be working on together, sharing information. So for sure, it's a big concern, um, uh, the intensity of fires, the frequency of fires, how big they are, that forest grows back a little bit different afterwards, caribou can't reach, you know, the lichen on the, the different trees that are growing in the north. Yeah, big concerns, big ones, but I see them as an, as an and, not as climate change or biodiversity conservation, and I've been very concerned about uh, people looking at um, techie solutions about climate change that aren't fundamentally about stopping emissions to begin with. Uh, that's a big one, but that's not a core part of, of my work anymore. That's great. There, we've, we've got way more questions now coming in than we're going to have time for, but maybe just one last one to, to follow up. I, I got a question from Chris Neal about uh, the connection between Y2I and, and the Wildlands Project and whether there's any sort of continental visions that connect maybe to the eastern part. Yeah, great idea. And Wildlands, you know, what, an, what a wonderful vision across the whole region. So at very high levels, um, we do uh, we do talk. I'm not involved in those in those conversations specifically, but certainly folks who are on our board, um, some of the strategic advisors who are involved, definitely uh, talking about about those things and how for people who aren't familiar with the Wildlands Network, it's not you know the Yellowstone Yukon region is southern Wyoming to the northern Yukon. Wildlands Network is like all across North America and and in the east as well. So I think one of the one of the things that um, is useful is to think is to look at what's working in different places and trying to scale that up. I don't see that as competition at all. Uh, I know sometimes from the outside it might look like oh different NGOs are like trying to jockey for position on these things. There's so much collaboration. Uh, it, it's really fruitful, and I would love to. I would love to talk um, more to people who are working out even at extending edges of the Y2Y region. We're unlikely to to change. We're not going to go to Yucatan. It has to be another place that starts with Y to begin with. Um, but yeah, I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. And to tell the stories about these things. 
Yeah. So if you have thoughts, I'd love to love to follow up. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Um, I'll, I'll try to connect you with some of the folks who had questions that we're running out of time to get to and, and can maybe follow up uh, sort of separately on the side. But thanks again for coming and, and talking to everyone throughout the day today. This was really great. And, and I'm so grateful. My pleasure. I'm, I'm really grateful for the invitation. It's nice to nice to meet some of you. And please do if you're thinking about, you know, students, projects, postdocs, uh, Smith fellowships, we are interested in social science a lot more social science than we've done in the past. I am not a social scientist, so I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, and yeah, lots of grants and things. So please keep in touch. Yeah, great. Thanks, Aaron. Take care. Bye, everyone.